Hey, what's up everybody, and welcome back to The Sanctuary. I'm Professor C, and we're going to do some more AMP today. Specifically, we're going to look at some glands and some epithelial membranes. So let's jump in. Alright, so this is a little mini talk. It is considered to be an epithelium talk, but it's specifically going to focus on glandular tissue and epithelial membranes. So a little shorty here, a lot of definitions, not so many pictures. When we talk about a gland, always think epithelium first. And yes, it could be a single cell, it could be a group of cells, it could even be an organ that comes from some sort of endothelial origin. And these glands will remove material from the blood, alter them, concentrate them, secrete them for further use somewhere else in the body or remove them completely from the body. Endocrine glands are ductless, meaning they don't have a tube or a duct that the secreted product travels through. In an endocrine system, the product is called a hormone and these hormones are secreted straight into the blood and then they will use the bloodstream to deliver them to their target. This could be a target organ, a target tissue, but we use the word target a lot when we talk endocrine system. Exocrine glands are the opposite. Exocrine glands have ducts, or, and here's the kicker for that, or, or, they secrete their product onto body surfaces or into body cavity. So something like a sweat gland that doesn't have a duct may still be considered an exocrine gland if it secretes its product straight onto the surface of the body. Salivary glands, sweat glands, oil glands, mucus glands, these are all examples of exocrine glands. Again, not all of them have ducts all the time. They may secrete their product directly into a cavity or onto a surface. Styles of exocrine glands, miracrine, apocrine, and holocrine. Miracrine glands secrete a product via exocytosis, which we talked about in a previous lecture, straight into a duct for delivery. True sweat glands, those sweat glands that you're born with, that cool the body. Tear glands, sometimes you can call them tear ducts, right? Intestinal glands, salivary glands, these are all examples of miracrine glands. They make a product and the cell remains intact, and they secrete that product straight into a duct via exocytosis. Apocrine glands are different. They will release their products as buds, so the cell becomes damaged a little bit as it buds off the apical surface. Again, we learned this word in the previous lecture, the top surface, the exposed surface. So the top part of the cell is actually removed. It will repair itself, of course, as it releases more buds. Now, when you hear apocrine glands, think something that's post-pubertal. A lot of these do not form or come online until the pubertal event has occurred. So post-pubertal sweat glands, mammary glands are the two major examples of apocrine glands. Holocrine, and the way I remember this, even though it may be a little silly. I think the whole, the whole thing, hollow, whole, right? The whole thing is destroyed. The holocrine gland is completely obliterated as it releases its products. It pretty much explodes its products out and we have to make a new type of cell or a new type of gland to make more product. Sebaceous glands, which you could, you know, substitute the word oil glands, again, a post-pubertal uh, type of gland, and meibomian glands, uh, special oil glands that are found in parts of the eye. Actually, not the eye itself, but some of the eyelids and the structures that line the eye. So we can get an oily substance secreted across the eye. So three types of exocrine glands by class, miracrine, apocrine, and holocrine. We talked about goblet cells in the previous lecture when we looked at some of the columnar epithelial types. They are unicellular glands. Now, even though they're ductless, and you'll never see a duct, they are considered exocrine because they do secrete their product straight onto the tissue surface in that apical space. 
Okay, the second part of this talk has to do with the epithelial membranes. Now, just a simple definition here. Some sort of epithelial tissue, which we've seen in the previous lecture, and some sort of connective tissue, which we know is attached underneath it, under the basement. So, an epithelial membrane, the epithelium itself and the connective tissue that underlies it. Four major types. Most books just focus on the first three, but I'm going to give you all four here just for completeness' sake. Cutaneous, that's another fancy word for saying the skin. If you hear about a cutaneous membrane, just think about the skin. Mucous membranes, those that secrete mucus. Serous membranes is a little bit more complicated, and I'll take a few moments to describe that one in a, in a minute. And a synovial membrane, which is, when you think synovial, think about movable joints like the knee and the shoulder and so forth, where you have uh, a wide range of motion with the joint. A lot of those are lubricated with some sort of synovial tissue. The cutaneous membrane, again, to keep it simple, is the skin, and its function is protection. That one is pretty straightforward. Mucous membranes, again, those that secrete mucus, these are often called mucosae. These line body cavities that are open to the outside world. So think of the respiratory airways where you breathe in, breathe out. Digestive, both the opening and the end of it, and genitourinary openings, all open to the outside world, and they're often protected by a lining of mucosae, uh, both to secrete mucus for lubrication, but also to kind of act as a sticky trap if any type of foreign particle or object tries to enter the body through these large spaces, which they often do. There's some mucus on these openings to stick any foreign substance that comes in. Serous membranes. This is the one that's the most complicated of the four. And so you see a lot of test questions on this usually. So let me explain serous membranes. Now you could call them the serosae, the same way you could call the mucous membranes the mucosae. It is a double membrane system, something we've seen a few times in here. And it lines ventral cavities that are enclosed, right? If the mucosae line the openings of the body, the serosae line the enclosed cavities within the body. Same story though, it's for protection and lubrication, but the picture here will be worth more than this. So let's draw this out real quick on the next slide so we can see what it looks like. If I were to draw an organ, and let's just draw something silly like a heart, and let's just make it look like a heart that you see on the Valentine's Day cards. Beautiful. So there's an organ called a heart. If you could look out, and I'm going to exaggerate this so we can see it. If you could look beyond the heart, there would be some sort of sac around the heart, right? Further out. And this is part of the serosae. It is called the parietal layer of the serosae. Parietal, every time you see that word, think about a wall, and that usually helps you get to the answer. So a parietal layer, layer is the most superficial portion of the double serous membrane. It acts like a wall protecting the organ. If this were a heart, and it is even though the picture is silly, I would call this a parietal, parietal pericardium. Peri, again peri meaning around, cardia referring to the heart. So specifically, I would call that layer that walls off the heart from the rest of the body, the parietal pericardium. If it were the lungs, we'd see the same sort of situation. Instead of a heart there, there would be a lung and there would be a parietal layer of the serosa known as the parietal pleura. If it were in the intestines, you'd see the same situation. You'd see a wall protecting the intestines. This would be the parietal peritoneum. Okay, let me change my color. And then we'll talk about the second layer, visceral. To find the visceral layer, you need to go to the organ itself. And just like I've drawn here in yellow, there's a blanket of this double serous membrane that intimately touches the organ. It's like laying on top of the heart. Now, this is the visceral layer. And so I'd call this yellow stuff, I'll just put a V for visceral, the visceral pericardium. 
So there's the two main layers. If it, again, if it were the, the lungs, would have a parietal pleura and a visceral pleura. If it were the intestines, would have a parietal peritoneum and a visceral peritoneum that intimately touches it. Now, in between these two layers, and I've exaggerated the picture purposefully, so we can see there is some space in between, and the space in between is fluid filled. And if I bring up the text, it's going to be washed out by my drawings, but I'll pull it up anyway. It's called, well, serous fluid. And watch out calling it serious fluid. A lot of students would do that. A lot of students would try to spell it that way. There is no I in there. It's not serious fluid, even though it is pretty serious. It's referred to as serous. So you could, again, generically call it serous fluid, but you could call it pericardial fluid. And its function says is for lubrication. As the heart contracts, it's kind of a violent ringing of the tissue. And you don't want it to have friction against surrounding tissues and cause burns. So we have this serous fluid between the two layers, between the parietal and the visceral layer, providing some kind of lubrication. Synovial membranes is the one that's often left out of talks. Again, just think of joint tissue when you see synovia, especially the movable joints like the knee and the shoulders and so forth. There's a synovial fluid that is secreted from the membranes, which reduces friction and allows these joints to slide across each other and move smoothly so there's no catching and there's no kind of grabbing so the tissue gets torn or ripped or twisted in some strange way. All right, very briefly, that was it. Thanks for watching that little shorty. Uh, check out some more videos in the series. We're going to do some more histology in the next one. So, bye-bye.